Hello and welcome to another episode of Guess That Record. I am your host, Jackson Reed. This is the show where we talk about music and try to figure out which album I pulled from my collection. As always, thanks again for tuning in. Our guest this week is one of the founding members of the band Toto. As the group's longtime keyboard player, he helped write some of their most popular songs, such as Hold the Line, Rosanna, and Africa. He's also a veteran session player, having famously worked on albums such as Silk Degrees by Boz Skaggs and Michael Jackson's Thriller. I'm very excited to be speaking today with David Page. How are you doing, David? Hey, I'm doing great. How's everybody there? Oh, we're doing good. We're doing good. Now, uh, uh, where am I talking to you from today? Uh, I'm in Los Angeles at a place called Calabasas, which is right near Malibu and uh, uh, across from Hidden Hills where the Kardashians live. And, uh-huh. and so I'm, I'm kind of, it's called the West Valley. Nice. Yeah, I... Uh, I haven't been to LA in about five years. I, I want to go back. <laughs> yeah, it's still here. It's still here. <laughs> that's that's good. That's good. All right. Um, and once again, it's it's great to be speaking with you. Um, and it, it's quite cool because you've played on so many songs that I've you know been hearing for my whole life. So it, it's really exciting to to be having you on the show today. Oh well, I'm glad to be a part of uh, your musical history there. And yeah. Uh, It's been a fun journey. For sure. For sure. Um, Now, if you're a regular listener of the podcast, you'll know that I always start off by asking the guests sort of what moment you got your start uh, with music or sort of where you began to take it seriously. Uh, But the thing that's quite interesting with you is that, you know, you were sort of born into a musical family as your dad, uh, Marty Page, was like a legit guy in the industry. So what impact did he have? Uh, getting you involved in music he had a big impact uh my father he was my mentor and uh uh i started playing piano picking out notes on the piano when i was five years old he was a jazz pianist so he helped me uh, navigate through a couple little songs when i was five years old and then i started uh, playing piano taking piano lessons when i was eight years old and i probably started taking it seriously when i got to be about 12 I started taking classical lessons and uh, for the next four or five years. And, uh, uh, but my father's uh, guidance uh, was uh, 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 just, it's so important to me when I was uh, mm-hmm. growing up and uh, uh, helping me with my piano playing and uh, just my overall musicianship, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I will say it's kind of, it's kind of fascinating to read about your dad because, you know, I was looking at the list of people he worked with and it was like, you know, Dean Martin and Sammy oh, Davis yeah. Jr. And it's kind of cool how, you know, you ended up working with a lot of famous, uh, famous musicians, but just different generations, I guess. Right. Yeah. It's kind of like father, like son, but my father was, he was a real legend. I mean, he did the Ray Charles uh, sound, modern sounds and country Western music which right. sold like 5 million copies that year. And uh, and he's worked with Ella Fitzgerald. He's worked with Barbara Streisand. He's worked with gospel artists like Mahalia Jackson. And uh, he's been very diverse. Mm-hmm. And um, sort of going back to your start in music, were you always a piano guy or did you have interest in playing other instruments? I was originally a drummer. Uh, when I was five, I, I got a couple of drums from my dad's uh, uh, friends who were professional drummers. And I took drumming very seriously. I really wanted to be a drummer until uh, I got to be eight years old. And then uh, uh, I think uh, I, the Beatles came out and I think rock and roll took over. And uh, that's what I wanted to do is be a rock and roll piano player after that. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm, if you started on drums, it sort of makes sense to go to piano because it is technically a percussion instrument. It, it so. absolutely is. Very astute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and you would have grown up in L.A. then. Is that correct? Yes. I would have grown up yeah. in L.A. visiting Hollywood a lot, you know, with sessions. Right. And, stuff like that. Uh, and, and I have to imagine that's that's the best hometown to have when you're starting out as a musician because so much of the industry is in LA. Um, 
And uh, when, so yeah, like when did you get your start professionally? Was it in a band or did you sort of go to session work right away? Um, it wasn't, uh, I started doing, well, professional work. I mean, I started working bar mitzvahs and weddings when I was like mm -hmm. 13 and 14. But uh, my probably first professional gig was I played with a group called Seals and Crofts. Mm -hmm. And uh, they hired me to play at the Santa Monica Civic when I was 16 years old. So I got to play my first live gig with them as far as uh, professional live gigs. And uh, after that, um, they asked me to play on a record. And uh, I played on a hit single called Diamond Girl, which mm. was their one of their first big hits. And uh, that kind of launched me because the word of mouth spread very quickly in Hollywood. And uh, uh, so I started getting a lot of work then. Awesome. Yeah, I, that's funny. You mentioned Seals and Crofts because I remember hearing all those songs. Uh, my dad would play them in the car when I was a kid. So that's uh, oh, yeah, that's sure. interesting that that's where you Absolutely. got your start. Yeah. Um, and, and so from there, what were some of the like the first big albums that you worked on? Well, it was that album and then uh, the Seals and Crofts stuff. And then I think uh, after that, Boss Skaggs was my next big uh, uh, album that I worked on and uh, got to co-write the record with Boz and Jeff Percaro and David Hungate, Toto uh, Rhythm Section was there playing on it. And I mm -hmm. think that really launched, uh, that uh, kind of validated me as a um, songwriter, up and coming songwriter. And I got to uh, uh, spread my wings a little bit and start to write my own stuff and uh, which would later become Toto. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, it was funny. I was going to bring up uh, there it is. The, this album, Silk Degrees, yeah, with Boz Skaggs. Oh. And um, it, uh, it, it's, it was sort of a, like a last chance record for, for Boz, who hadn't really hit it big yet. Um, so going into that record, did you think it was just going to be sort of like another job? Or did you think like, oh, we've, we've got something special here? I thought we had something special here. I thought it was a golden opportunity to really spread our wings and let them hear what we were all about. You know what I mean? Part partially because I was able to lay down the music, a lot of music for Boz to write lyrics for, because he's a great lyricist and he wrote all the lyrics on that, except for one song, uh, uh, Love Me Tomorrow, which I wrote. And, uh, uh, but he's a great lyricist and came up with some great melodies on top of things like uh, Low Down and, uh, Lido Shuffle, and uh, uh, I think it was just a magical experience. It was a, a good marriage. Mm -hmm. and, and you bring up Low Down, which was uh, one of the ones you co-wrote. And the thing that was interesting with that song, because obviously it was like the biggest hit from that album, mm -hmm. and it um, it wasn't really a hit when it first came out. It sort of took like radio stations just playing it off the record yeah. for it to sort of to hit it really big, but um, yeah, was that was that sort of the song that um, kind of put your name on the map in a way? It did, and it was really a surprise. It was a surprise track. No one thought that would become a hit because we thought it was just too musical. It was just mm -hmm. too jazzy and musical and uh, all the good things that stop sometimes music from being a hit, you know? Uh, it was very yeah. sophisticated, sophisticated record, I thought, and uh, has a guitar solo in the middle of it and has strings. And uh, we were very pleasantly surprised how, how it skyrocketed to the top. Mm -hmm. and, and this is something I have to ask about Lowdown because I, I've thought about this a lot. Because um, it, it came out right at the peak of like the disco era. So there's, right. there's definitely a connection there. And, and I even read that the producers of Saturday Night Fever tried to get it into the soundtrack for that. Yes, that's um, true. Yeah. But for me, I, I don't know if it fits in with like other disco songs at that time because it it feels more sophisticated and more like a true R and B song. So, do you think it's disco or is it something else? Well, no, it came out of that uh, era, though. You know, so we were playing. It's funny, the rhythm section and myself, we had been playing on other people's disco records, so we were familiar with the beats, and mm -hmm. so we were just trying to raise the bar with disco music and, and make it something uh, into an intelligent kind of song or something that, that 
had some meat to it, you know. So, yeah. uh, but the funny thing about Saturday night, I read a, a thing in John Travolta's book where he said they cut all the dance scenes in Saturday Night Live to uh, low down if they used it, you know. So right. it wasn't be on the soundtrack, but uh, I think uh, uh, someone intervened and uh, pr- uh, uh, vetoed that. So uh, mm-hmm. anyway. Yeah, well, I, I read that it was um, it was because uh, Columbia Records was like attached to a different disco movie that they wanted to use Lowdown in, but then that movie didn't end up getting made. Right. So, right. yeah, right. Um, mm-hmm. uh, anyways, so you mentioned when you're making Silk Degrees that you had Jeff Percaro and David Hungate, who, uh, of course, you would be in Toto with. Was that the record where you guys went like, "Hey, we should start a band"? Yeah, it was. It was pretty soon after that. After that record uh, started coming into the spotlight, uh, record people started coming up to us saying, "You guys should form a band together." Of course, we had already we had planned to reform our band from high school and eventually, you know, do something with a band. So it seemed like a good idea because uh, we were also playing live with Boz. So they were able to see that we could also knew how to perform and had stage presence as well. Mm-hmm. So it, mm-hmm. was a, it was a it was a package with a bow tied around it, you know. Right, and uh, it, it's sort of interesting because I'm a musician myself that's uh, trying to get signed and get get my career off the yeah. ground, and it, it's uh, it, it's interesting when you look at Toto, and I guess it's just sort of how it was back then, but it's it sort of seemed like. Once you guys got together, you had a, a record deal and you're already recording your first album. It's uh, it's interesting how quickly things could get together back then. Of course, you guys had been grinding for years to get to that point. Right. So, right. Yeah, mm-hmm. that, that helped that we were we were in the studio every day. So we were always constantly rehearsing our material a little bit, you know, in between takes or at the end of sessions. We'd start playing, jamming on some of the things that became the Toto songs. And uh, mm-hmm. I think that our experience, we had so many hours of experience and had met all the uh, executives from all the various different record companies that it uh, really put us, uh, raised our bar and put us with a, gave us a lot of experience. So by the time we did our first album, we had done, you know, uh, many albums under our belt with other artists. So it was, uh, it was, uh, uh, we were ready to, to, to make our mark. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so when you made that first record, you, you guys already had a big hit with hold the line. Uh, and of course that song is built around the well-known piano riff. Uh, and is, is that where you started with that song? Yes, we did. I had just moved out of my house and I just got my first upright piano in, uh, my apartment and I started playing that riff. And I think I played it for like three days. I think people were knocking on my door, screaming at me to stop playing the riff, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, then I wrote the rest of the song and brought it to the guys, the band. And we got into a little rehearsal room and tried it out. And it, we just sounded like a band. We sounded just like the record um, on the first time we played it through. So uh, we knew we had something and that uh, it was going to be something special. Yeah. This episode of Guess That Record is sponsored by Guitar Works. One of Canada's top independent music stores for over 30 years, Guitar Works carries a huge selection of musical instruments from the biggest brands in music, including Gibson, Fender, Martin, Yamaha, and Paul Reed Smith. Visit any of their three Calgary locations or shop online at guitarworks.ca and join the Guitar Perks program to earn money back with every purchase. Guitar Works your total guitar store. This episode of Guess That Record is sponsored by Marvel Marketing. Marvel Marketing is an award-winning digital marketing company headquartered in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Working with clients in different industries from all over North America, including Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Marvel Marketing services include website design and development, website maintenance, search engine optimization, public relations services, and social media management, amongst others. To find out more, visit marvelmarketing.ca. This episode of Guess That Record is also sponsored by Recordland, home to the largest selection of music in Canada. Buy, sell, and trade tapes, 
CDs, and vinyl. Located in Calgary's Inglewood neighborhood on 9th Avenue Southeast, visit them in person or online at recordlandcalgary.com. You can also follow them on Instagram at recordlandcalgary. Um, and uh, I'm just going to bring this one up here. Overall, Toto 4 is yeah. uh, the band's biggest album. And uh, I also like there's you on the back there. That's um, right. Um, uh, so when, when you look at the first album, it did very well for a debut record. Um, but the next two albums didn't sell as well. So did the, the pressure to make another hit sort of affect the songwriting on Toto four or were you guys just, did you just go in and those were the songs and, and that was it? No, we definitely knew that our, our, uh, um, career was hanging in the balance at that Mm. time. And uh, they were like, uh, the record companies like, if you don't guys don't come up with another hit on your next record, uh, you're going to be in dire straits, you know. And uh, so I went in with it thinking, we've got to write our bet, make our best album ever here. Uh, that's not only just a commercial success, but also has depth to it and has musicality to it and, and uh, all the good production and everything, uh, you know, lyrics and melody. And so uh, the first song I wrote was Rosanna for it because I thought if this song doesn't make it, I said I'm gonna I'm gonna give up, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I thought this is good. This has everything I know about songwriting put into one song. So uh, it ended up having uh, vocal, varied vocalists. Uh, it had the guitar solo, a synth solo, and a great drum intro on it. And I thought it it was very diverse and showed off the talents. And the, the the musical technique of the players uh, in the band. Mm-hmm. And, and one of the reasons I'm excited to speak with you today is because you know Africa uh, is really sort of your song because um, you wrote it and you sang it, uh, and and it's one of those songs that you still hear on the radio all the time. You know, one of the first songs you think of when you think like '80s pop, and. Yeah. I find that as a younger person who listens to older music, it's one that has really like transcended generations. Because I, I remember being in high school, which wasn't too long ago for me, and I would get teased by my friends and other people for what I listened to. Yeah. But Africa was one of those songs where, you know, like if my friends and I were going to the movies, I could play it in the car and everyone would sing along to it. Really? Um, oh, that's very yeah. cool. Yeah, I I really admire how you wrote a song that's just loved by millions of people from all walks of life. Like, that's, you know, that's the dream as a musician. It's got to be so cool to, you know, say, like, that's my song. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. It's very, um, it's very multi-generational and, you know, handed down from, I think, parents to kids. And uh, that just shows you, goes to show you if you don't try too hard on to make something, you know what I mean? Or, Or think out of the box. Just try and think. I want. We wanted to make something we'd never made before. The kind of record. So it ended up being the first of the like global music that you that we heard from the time. But right. uh, uh, yeah, that's a very special song, and, and it seems to keep uh, the, the the listeners seem to have an insatiable appetite for requesting that song on Spotify. Mm-hmm. It has like a billion streams from Spotify and. Uh, so people are requesting it out there, and uh, I'm glad they did. Yeah, and I, I even, you know, I, I watched the music video last night just to see it again, and I noticed on YouTube it has like 800 million views. Like, <laughs> that's crazy. I know, that's, um, that's sick. Yeah, a- and you sing Africa, and obviously you had sung some songs with Toto before that, but uh-huh. Africa was the first song that you had lead vocals on that like was a single and was a number one hit. So did yeah. that give you some validation for yourself as a vocalist? It did. Um, and yes and no. Uh, first of all, it was great that I was able to sing on because I was the only one able to get all the words out. So I ended up being by drawing straws. I drew the short straw and I was the one that had to sing it. And Bobby Kimball did a great job singing the choruses. But uh, the band's reaction was like, well, next time you write a hit single, make sure our lead singer's singing it and not you singing it, you know what I mean? Because I wasn't really the lead singer, you know? 
I was just a guy who could, because I, my Elton practicing to sing Elton John songs, I could, I could spit out a lot of words. So that's, uh, what, uh, I could, ended up being by rote, uh, um, me being the lead singer on that song. But, uh, mm-hmm. it's fun, it's fun to play it live. I get a big kick out of it and the crowd really, uh, is passionate about it. Yeah. And, and you sort of, you were mentioning there how the band was sort of like, you know, next time, write one for the lead singer. Um, That's right. I, I, I sort of, it sort of seemed like they were a bit unsure about that song, uh, before it came out and all that. Definitely. That was like 11th hour song. Uh, we had had the whole album done, uh, you know, with Rosanna and, uh, the band, we just, I had brought this, I'd gotten a new synthesizer and I started playing that riff, the opening riff on the synthesizer. And I brought it to the band and said, I have, I finished this song. Uh, can we try it? And so we just started doing an experimental version of it, uh, kind of with a, made a loop with Jeff Percaro on drums and used old fashioned Beatles style where you wrap the tape around the mic stands and it makes a big gigantic loop in the room. And mm-hmm. then we overdubbed to that. And as it blossomed, as it started uh, to, un, un, uh, the, the apple started to get unpeeled, uh, it started to really turn into something magnificent. And, uh, and, and, uh, uh, we just couldn't deny it. You know, we, we just kept at it, overdubbing on it. And, uh, it turned out to be, like I said, a magical, some, a magical tune. Mm-hmm. Totally. And, um, I wanted to ask about, uh, I wanted to ask about some of the stuff you've done outside of Toto, uh, yeah. especially this album here, Thriller. Yeah. Um, so it, it's kind of f- funny cause the last episode that I did was, um, with uh, a group called the Hot City Horns, and they are Paul McCartney's horn section. Oh, great. Oh, they're fabulous. Uh-huh. And and the record I had them guess uh, when they were on was Thriller. So it's kind of cool how we were just talking about it, and now we've got someone that played yeah. on the album. Yeah. Um, so uh, was, uh, like, of all the songs you've worked on on that record, was Human Nature the one that you spent the most time on? I think so. I was just funny you should mention this. I was just talking to Steve Percaro yesterday about human nature and uh, how we went about doing it. And uh, uh, yeah, that was the band uh, putting on uh, uh, overdubs one at a time. And uh, we kind of made a demo of it. So we kind of knew going in what we needed to do. And uh, Steve Lukather added this great R&B guitarist. Jeff, Jeff added his uh, drums. And uh, I played bass and, and played the synths on it. Oh. And uh, Steve Ricardo did as well. And uh, it was a very special song on the Michael Jackson album. He sang it great. And uh, uh, it's a time, again, another timeless piece. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that that is my favorite Michael Jackson song. Like it just, every time I hear it, I sort of like just drift off and think about life and oh, stuff like great. that. That's fabulous. Yeah. I'll tell you. yeah. Um, and, uh, I also read, though, that you worked on uh, The Girl Is Mine, which is the duet with Michael and Paul McCartney. Um, I did indeed. So w- what did you add to that song? Well, they Quincy asked me to help arrange it song, which means when you get into a room, there's not a lot of notes written. The arrangement's not written out. It just has chord symbols like G to C to F. And, and we, it's up to ours to make it fit in the genre that they're doing, which is kind of like a mid, it was kind of a mid tempo, soft R and B kind of mm-hmm. song. So mm-hmm. uh, that was the, that was the groove that we uh, laid down for it. And uh, uh, it was so great because Paul was there, Linda McCartney was there, George Martin and Jeffrey Emmerich were there and Quincy mm-hmm. Jones and Bruce Swedeen were there. So we had the best of the best were in that room and it yeah. was great meeting Paul McCartney and listening to him sing him and Michael sing live while we're playing, you know? So, uh, that was a real, uh, pinch me moment, you know, and some I, rare, rarefied air. Yeah. I, I was going to ask like if you were there while they were singing or if, if you'd sort of did that separately, but that's cool that you were there while they were working together. They were singing live for us. I think they redid their vocals, but they did sing it live the duet while we were there. That's awesome. Wow. Um, and, and you did a lot of sessions with Michael over the years. 
So mm -hmm. I think you, you have a rare insight that not many people have in the fact that you got to spend time with him sort of in more quieter scenarios. Cause like, you know, I think like Elvis, the Beatles and Michael are probably like the only people that have reached like that stupid level of fame where it's just like craziness right. wherever they show up. Uh, right. So yeah. Well, what was it like to work with Michael and, and spend time with him? It's funny the first, the, that you should mention that. The first time I got to meet Michael, I went into a room and we were working on Billie Jean. Now, the part mm -hmm. I played didn't end up on the uh, record, but I, I did work on it with him. And uh, he was a perfectionist. And he was, very, first of all, he's very kind, very sweet art, and uh, very um, open-minded to anything you want to do. But he is a, a very much a perfectionist, and so is, so am I. So we got along on that level, you know. I told him, I said, "Don't let anything slide on my parts when you're when I'm playing this stuff here, you know, because I want to get him perfect." So he mm -hmm. appreciated that that I took pride in my work like he did, and uh, and we started uh, getting on uh, with our uh, laughing, laughing a lot, and and playing a lot of music. That's cool, yeah, and. Uh keep reaching down and getting albums. I, I read yeah. that you worked on this one here. We are the world. I did. I did. Uh huh. And, um, uh, I, firstly, was that sort of the Quincy Jones, Michael Jackson connection that got you that opportunity? And secondly, uh, did you record your parts in advance of the, the famous session where everyone was uh, singing there? No, uh, my parts were like the last parts to go on. There was the last parts was Ray Charles saying his part at the very end right and right and at uh, and right in the middle of my session ray came in and sang they stopped my session and ray came in and sang and then he left and then we finished my session and basically steve percaro and i there's a verse or a chorus that has these kalimba almost africa type mm -hmm. sounds on it right and that's what steve and i a added to which was the africa uh kind of signature to it a little bit with kalimbas okay yeah and it's funny you mentioned we heard the whole record was done before we got that stuff on there right that that's interesting you mentioned those parts though because like i i noticed them when i was listening like i i hadn't i hadn't heard it before and then i was listening to it and then i heard like those little things yeah. in the verse there and i was like oh that's yes. a little texture there that i never heard before um, well, good ears. You, you have, you're very astute listening, you know. <laughs> it's um, kind of a, another cool sort of connection between you and your dad there where you both uh, bumped into Ray Charles there. Yeah, we certainly did. My dad mm -hmm. had uh, we worked on his early albums, and then uh, 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 I got to work with Ray Charles on the, on the We Are the World album. So that was a, a very nice connection there. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you about your setup as a keyboard player, but more specifically back in the day, because obviously today keyboard equipment is like a lot easier to get set up and that sort of thing. Right. Um, so, you know, like, let's say we're, we're, you're working on Toto 4. So how many keyboards did you use on that record? We used an awful lot. I had a whole studio full of keyboards. I mean, the mm. hardware keyboards where, you know what I mean? Here's a, a GS1, which is the ultimate CS80 from Yamaha. And there's a thing called a CS80. We, we, had, we had one of those. We had mini Moogs. We had ARC 2600s. We had uh, a Polyfusion modular. I had my nine foot grand piano. And uh, we just about had every instrument, uh, you know, from Wurlitzer electric pianos to uh, Hammond organs and organic instruments as well as synthesizers right and, and like are you just when you're making that record are you just like leaving it at the studio for the duration of the recording or do you have to like haul that stuff back and forth from your house to the studio that was a very very astute um question uh uh we ended up making a recording studio at my house we bought a couple of uh six ampex 16 track machines and uh, uh, our 24 track machine, excuse me. And uh, uh, we recorded a lot of it at my house. Instead of moving all the gear, we just thought it'd be easier to move a roll of tape, you know, yeah. from the studio to that studio, which was what we did a lot in those days. We even did that on human nature. 
we did some of the recording at my house uh, because it was easier than moving all the gear down there, you know, the tons of gear. Uh, we started, we're one of the first home studios to start actually keeping keeping the uh, the, the recordings that we did in our home studio. So it right. worked out really great. Yeah. And, um, you know, like with, when it comes to like the recording process itself uh, back then, you know, obviously you can like mic up a piano. Um, but like when it comes to the to the synthesizers, would it be sort of like a guitar where you just plug it into the console and that's how it was recorded? A lot of it was recorded direct. Yes. But I understand sometimes when I'm recording, I like to run the synthesizer into a guitar amp and mm -hmm. have an additional microphone. I learned that from Peter Gabriel, who does mm -hmm. that always mics mics up the instruments no matter what they are so that there's a little bit of organic air being moved you know so, right uh, yeah mo most sense though were, were taken direct mm -hmm. and um i also uh, i wanted to ask you about this because uh in august you put out uh, a solo album called forgotten toys uh, I did which indeed. is which is your first solo album so what what was the decision for you to finally go and make your own record well, I had these pe I had these little odds and ends and pieces that I've, I've been around for a few years, and uh, my colleagues uh, in the band, Joseph Williams and Steve Lukather, they were making solo records. So uh, this was right pre right before the pandemic, mm -hmm. and so they were. I was helping them with their solo records, and they said, "Well, you tell you need to make a solo record too." And I said, well, I don't know what I do for a solo record. You know, I, I'm just what I'm doing for Toto. They said, no, take all those odds and ends and, and those good pieces that you've been playing for years for us, uh, put them together and uh, see what you come up with. So I ended up with Joseph going in my studio for about a year and a half and uh, recording and, and uh, writing songs for uh, Forgotten Toys. And I'm very happy that I did complete my first uh it's my first solo project so uh i was very happy with the way it turned out very fulfilling that's good yeah um and, and it was quite cool to see the list of people that worked on the album because of course you have your your toto buddies on there but then there was like don felder brian eno michael mcdonald ray parker jr it, it sort of reminds me of another guy that you've worked with uh randy newman where when you look oh, at yeah. his albums it's like oh, yeah. it's so, it's fun to look at each track and see who he got to work on on the record. Yeah, very much the same kind of thinking with Randy, who mm -hmm. used to. We both used uh, uh, Nathan East on bass. We both used Steve Lukather on guitar. You know, and uh, uh, yeah, it was. I, I have a lot of great friends that are great musicians. People like Steve Jordan, who just joined the Rolling Stones. Uh, he played on Queen Charade. And uh, Greg Bissonette, who's with Ringo, and of course Steve Lukather's with Ringo too, played on the record. Mm -hmm. And uh, Don Felder played slide guitar; he was amazing on slide guitar. And Mike McDonald's an old friend, so uh, I'd worked on his record. So I asked him if he could just throw in a couple of high parts for me, and he said no problem. So uh, it's kind of the way the musician, the musical brotherhood works, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and my, my favorite song off of, uh, forgotten toys was, uh, all the tears that shine, uh, which is an interesting song. Cause it was also on, uh, Toto 14 and right. the Toto version was sung by you, but on this album, you had Michael Sherwood, uh, sing, uh, that, that song. So, and he passed away in 2019. So yeah. the, this version of the song had to have been in the works for quite a while then. Yeah, this was the original demo for the song, his vocal. And what I did is I went in and redid the track. But that was his original vocal. And I, I thought it, we need to honor him. And I need, wanted really wanted people to hear the original vocal on this to get the song across, to really tell the message. And I think that that was, uh, he's such a great singer, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's, he has this particular sound. And so we went in and I put, used Davy Johnston from Elton John's band played acoustic guitar on it and right. electric. And uh, uh, I had Lenny Castro again on it. And uh, uh, it, I, I, I'm really happy with the way that it turned out here. And uh, I'm glad that's your favorite song. Yeah, yeah. Um, now to end off the interview, uh, I wanted to ask some rapid fire questions. 
So uh, what was the last album that you listened to? The last album I listened to had to have been uh, uh, Sgt. Pepper. Mm, that's that's my favorite Beatle record yeah. as well. So, yeah. Uh, what was the last album you listened to that you played on? Hmm, that I played on. I think it was Don Felder's last album, his solo album. I forget right. the name of it, but I know that I played on it. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite Toto record? My favorite Toto record, I'll always love the first Toto album, uh, uh, close to my heart, but I think the Toto 4 record is the best Toto record that we've made there. I think right. that's all in all a, a, a real to Toto masterpiece, if I know mm -hmm. I'm saying so, you know? Yeah. Uh, which music video that you've been in is your favorite? Uh, oh, geez. That's a tough one. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, oh, I don't know. Hydra, maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, besides keyboards, what other instruments can you play? I play a little bit of drums and I can strum a guitar, but I can't really play anything but keyboards. It's really my niche. Right. Um, favorite concert you've ever performed at? I've ever, I've ever performed at. Mm -hmm. hmm. Um, it would have to be, I think, you know, we did a memorial for Jeff Percaro and, uh, we had, uh, Donald Walter from Steely Dan were there. Eddie Van Halen played. George Harrison played, Boss Skaggs was there, and a multitude of just great artists all joined in. Don Henley, everybody joined in and, and contributed. And I think that was the most heartfelt uh, concert that I've ever been at. Awesome, yeah. Uh, and lastly, someone you've met that made you starstruck. The starstruck, whom? Uh, well, a couple of people. Elton John was one. Uh, uh, Paul McCartney was one, and I think uh, Keith Richards was one. I got to mm. work with Keith Richards. Perfect. Well, uh, we've reached the end of the interview. I want to thank uh, David Page for taking the time to come on the podcast. Uh, like I said earlier, I've been hearing songs that you've wrote and worked uh, on and played my whole life, so it's really cool to get to sit down and, and talk about some of them with you. It was great. I'm glad we were finally finally able to do this interview. And anytime you want to get a hold of me, uh, please uh, feel free. Awesome. I also wanted to take this opportunity to send a message to our Canadian listeners, specifically in Eastern Canada. Toto has recently announced that they are going on tour in 2023 with Journey, and that includes four dates in Ontario and Quebec. On March 8th, they will be in Montreal. March 9th, Quebec City. March 12th in Toronto, and March 13th in Ottawa. Tickets for these shows are now available on Ticketmaster. Thanks again to you, the listeners. The fact that we keep getting such incredible guests is because you guys keep tuning in. And as always, I appreciate it. Leave a review wherever you listen, and tell a friend to check us out. We're also on Instagram at Guess That Record, so give us a follow there for updates and additional content. Remember to keep rocking, and we'll see you on the next episode of Guess That Record. 